Hey everyone, welcome to Action Cut and Everything In Between, episode number four. Today on the show I've got Carl Jenner. He was the director of photography on my film Life After Man and he's also just completed his own feature film called Guilt. So we're going to jump right in and we're going to listen to the power of cinematography and the impact that it has on your movie. Welcome to Action Cut and Everything In Between, a comprehensive guide to shooting a feature film all on your own. All right, so Carl Jenner, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's all right. So you've just shot uh, my film Life After Man and your own feature film Guilt, but how did you get to the point where you are now? Tell us about your journey over the years. Uh, For me, I actually started um, photography, underwater photography back in the day, and... uh, always had a fascination with, uh, you know, photography and cinema and, um, you know, anything creative graphics and things like that. And, uh, but, uh, my passion for diving led me into photography and I taught underwater photography and through, through my diving, I worked on, um, films and TV commercials, mainly doing a lot of underwater safety work, but some, um, shooting as well. And I met up with a, an old character who shot, documentaries on 16 mil um he used to build his own underwater housings and being working in the dive shop we just chatted and i used to go out with him and we'd test all these housings and shoot all this underwater footage and things like that and uh, we ended up um doing quite a bit and then um i just got hooked into uh filming and that kind of led me into where i am now so just you know an interest of uh you know, anything creative in in the photography field. And uh, I worked on TV shows and did some B-camera operating and shooting. And eventually people asked me to shoot stuff for them, mainly corporate videos and corporate training and lots of stuff. And I decided uh, one day I'd I'd just branch out on my own. And uh, I had a very primitive uh, setup back in the day with an old Amiga computer and a an old video camera and a an old VHS deck and a very primitive gen lock, which enabled me to overlay graphics onto, onto, um, tape and just had to kludge all this stuff together. So I had a very kind of early technical background in filmmaking. So it just kind of led me from there. And just as the technology grew, I just grew with the tech and, but I have to say, you know, I got a bit disappointed with cameras, you know, especially, um, video cameras, of uh, how terrible, quality they were so I actually stopped um, shooting for quite a number of years and just got myself heavily into post-production and I've always had a fascination with uh, visual effects so I taught myself visual effects I've always I've done 3D animation ever since you know the very early days that you could do it on a home computer and I uh, actually wrote software out of a book a ray tracer so that's how nerdy I was and uh, learned uh, computer graphics that way and then uh, so with my post-production editing and graphics and visual effects work, I just, you know, spent years helping other people make their films. And eventually, you know, uh, the 5D Mark III came out. And so my interest then was peaked to get back into shooting. And so I bought a 5D Mark II and shot that with that. And, um, and then my passion just ignited from there. And I just, you know, been full steam ahead ever since the shooting, 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 because now I can actually... Um, you know, what I have in my head or had in my head, I could actually get on the screen. And so that's, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist in a way. So I always hated the, um, those, those cameras and the, just the look was horrible and everything was horrible about them. But the, the, the modern tech enabled me to get my creative vision that I had in my head across and, uh, launched from there. So I just, you know, just hung around with cameras and, uh, lenses and things like that and just became creative. So. That's my uh, journey in a nutshell. Yeah, that's awesome. So it's pretty much the DSLR revolution and the the five D Mark II that got you to where you are today. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, probably maybe a little bit earlier with the with the um, Mini DV. I had a I can't remember what it was. It was Panasonic FS ninety or something like that. And I shot some. Um, I actually shot a a series for Fox Sports on old sports stars and we actually used that little camera and that kind of got me there but I never 
used it to shoot really any kind of anything of significance you know I did my corporate work and stuff on that and but um even when but the price of cameras you know like uh, you know digi beaters were astronomical and uh you know and they're and they're crappy and uh, so uh it wasn't until the 5d mark three came out that i thought no nah, that's you know i can now get some focus separation and do all that fancy stuff that you what what kind of gives it that cinematic look and and it was at an uh, affordable price so there you go yeah so since since the the 5d what cameras have you used or owned from that point to get to what where you are now and tell everyone what camera that you're using now okay uh well i bought a, a second hand 5d mark ii uh, and then I got a, I had a 7D as well. And um, I was shooting quite a lot with that. And then the thing that made me kind of migrate up was the, was the audio. The audio was always a challenge. And um, post syncing was, although it's, you know, achievable, it was always, you know, fraught with danger. And uh, so I built out a rig and it was like a big Franken monster uh, just to get audio out proper professional kind of audio with XLRs and um, I had preamps and all these sort of things stuck in there and it was just so many points of failure and always that fear in the back of your mind when you're on a big job that something's going to go really wrong and then you'll get back to the studio and and you know someone hadn't hit record or some there was a you know a hiss or a hum or, or something would just destroy it so it was just this you know fear so that's when um the Canon C100 came out, so I was very interested in that camera. And then, you know, and then working with other DPs and a good DP friend of mine, Tom Gleason, had a Red Epic at the time, and he also had a Red One. And we did some a lot of early testing. I did some, some VFX, and we shot some stuff on this Red One. So I was very familiar with the Red format and the difficulties in the early days with the R3D codec. But you know, being a bit of a tech head. I could get around all that and I helped a lot of other companies um, deal with their workflows with the red camera. And then, um, but the C100 was in my, pro kind of in my price range, but it was only 1080p, had, had um, Canon log on the camera, which was, again, it was interesting, but I, I could see that the world was moving to 4K pretty quickly. And then you could get 4K out of the C100, I think, but you had to buy an extra module. And um, and that price-wise, it pushed it up into the red scarlet range. So I started to, you know, like look at the at the scarlet as my next kind of camera. And I, I kind of then, being familiar with the red epic um, that of Tom's camera, I just thought no, the scarlet is probably the way to go. I had 4K native, um, had um, R3D, which is the really the major selling point of the red camera. So I jumped into that and I bought a, a scarlet and uh, I had all my lenses went with it. So because I had a lot of Canon lenses, so I just bought a Canon mount for it. And, um, you know, for about the same price as a fully kitted out C100, I bought a, a red um, scarlet at the time. But it was based on the um, MX sensor, which wasn't, you know, it was a great sensor. But, you know, at the time it was, uh, you know, probably the best one around, but uh, it aged pretty quickly. And so I shot with that camera for about probably about two years and it's enabled me to get on bigger projects, bigger, more high end stuff, um, shooting more high end projects. So that enabled me to basically that camera paid for itself. And once you're in the red ecosystem, you can actually red will buy your camera back and offer an upgrade path. And I think their mantra is obsolete, obsolete and obsolete or something like that. And so I jumped and bought the Epic, which still was an MX sensor, but enabled me to shoot 6K and had all the all the goodies on that. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't compromised in any way. So I jumped to that. And then um, about probably 18 months, I had that camera and then they, they had the Dragon sensor come out. And that was a beautiful sensor and still probably one of my favorite kind of looks and as the, in the red, red line of the as sensors go. And so I used a lot of my money from that camera to buy that sensor. So I got a sensor upgrade on that, which wasn't cheap. It was about $20,000, I think, Australian. So um, it was serious money. But the camera, you know, was paying for itself. So I was kind of at a break even point by then. So I was, you know, but, uh, and I had the Dragon for, 
you know, good two and a half years, I think. And that was a workhorse. That was a real workhorse. Loved the look of it. That that was just a tank. It was a bomb proof camera. Went through everything with me. And then uh, I then jumped to Epic W, which is then based on the helium sensor. Again, I, I would have probably stuck with the with the the dragon for a lot longer, but um, the new form factor and all the new goodies that were going in, and that's where they were going, and they offered a you know a very good upgrade path. So I jumped on that. And so currently I shoot with the Helium 8K, which is basically the 8K weapon. And that's my, that's my current camera. But I'm, you know, to be honest, I don't really, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm a red fanboy or anything, but um, I'd be pretty camera agnostic. If someone shoved a good camera in my, under my face, I would, I would use it. And that's so, uh, but I, you know, you use what you can afford. And fortunately I've, you know, I worked my way up into that camera over about five years, and uh, you know that's the that's the, the tool I've got. But if you're, you know, and it's, you know, for somebody starting out, it's way out of most people's uh, price range. But if you, you know, if you did what I did, you just start small and just build up and build up. But um, my God, you know, the the iPhone now shoots amazing pictures. So you know, you can have a good camera; it's in your pocket. Yeah. Now we sh- well, you shot um, both our films in 8K. Do yeah. you think that that's the way the industry is going, and where will this resolution kind of battle or war? Like, mm-hmm. where where will it end? And you know, what's the advantages that you found with shooting 8K? Um, okay, 8K. Yeah, I think 8K is where it's all going to go because you know TV manufacturers need to sell TVs. Um, you know. From a broadcast point of view, 8K is probably a long, long way away from a lot of broadcasters, especially in the country like Australia, where some of the cable channels are still on standard def because it's cost prohibitive just to get into to HD. But as an acquisition format to future proof your work, 8K is probably a good place to be. Um, the reason I, sh- I chose to shoot 8K for our projects was uh, twofold. One, is it maximizes the full width of the sensor on the camera without having to go to ProRes because the way that the RED camera works is that uh, you know you, have, you can have multiple resolutions, but it's a sensor crop when you start to lower the resolution. So if you go if you go down to 6K or 4K, you, it, it, it crops in on the sensor, so you lose a little bit of the width of the sensor, and um, you know potentially you know compromising you know you've got all those pixels that you paid for, so you might as well use them. So I shoot 8K 2 to 1, which on the RED camera is Super 35, but it's actually a little bit larger than a Super 35 sensor. So on any of my lenses, you know, I just want to maximize the the width of that sensor. Uh, And 8K 2 to 1 gives me the full sensor across. And because we shot um, the films with a, you know, looking at doing a 235 output because, you know, more cinematic. I just put up the frame guides for 235 and we just, you know, shot and framed everything within those those guides. And it gives us the ability then to, in post, just to do reframes and move, you know, give people more headroom if you feel like it or, or lower the headroom and that. But, you know, I'm not frightened of the 8K workflow and that. And, uh, and in fact, my system here is that I use is not, you know, particularly powerful. I've got a five-year-old iMac, um, 5K iMac. And I've just got our, our normal spinning backup drives, but with a fast RAID. And because I use Final Cut Pro, I just use their proxy workflow. And, you know, I don't, I barely touch the, the actual full res files, which just sit on my drive. And I just got the proxy files sitting on my hard drive. And I don't really have any slow kind of paid playback or anything like that. I've never had a glitch. I get perfect editing speed and I've got, I've got effects and layers and all that sort of stuff that all plays back in real time. So the workflow is not an issue with the, with these um, computers, even a five-year-old iMac. So, um, but the ability to reframe, maximize, you know, the width of the sensor um, just gives you more possibilities and stuff. And I love the, uh, you know, the red R3D, which is really its signature selling point to have that, to have the ability to go in and when you're on set, just, uh, you know, because we're moving so quickly, we don't have a lot of lights or equipment. so difficult lighting situations or shooting in very low light 
I can just, you know, I know how to use the tools on the camera. So I just look at my histogram on the camera. I can look at the I've got a little, you know, uh, a um, shortcut to look at the raw sensor data. So I can see what the sensor's seeing. And if I can see detail in there and I can double check that across with my, my histogram and my tools, I'm pretty, um, pretty confident that I'm, you know, I've got, I've got exposure I can work with in post. And uh, so when it comes back to post, I can, with the R3D, I'm not locked into ISO or any of that stuff. So I can change that to do shot matching from shot to shot, you know, because I'm flying around the ISOs all the time, you know, just to try and get exposure as I, as I need. I don't kind of lock myself into uh, an ISO, like a lot of, some DPs will just say, we'll shoot 800, that's it, the whole but once, once I, you know, once you're moving so quickly and I, I need to get a stop or two stops and I, I don't have time to change an ND or anything like that, or I, you know, and I do want to shoot fairly wide open most of the time, you know, one, five to, you know, two, eight is usually where, I, where, I'm, where I'm living. Um, sometimes I, you know, have to use an ISO change just to, you know, get those extra stops of light that I need. And it just, I know that I can go in back into the R3D and uh, and change all that uh, that data if I need to, and you know it's it's uh, it's worked so far, so I'm I'm pretty happy with that. And that's why I kind of I think I like the the red camera, just that that flexibility and that bit of a safety net. Yeah, so, so, it's awesome. Yeah. And guilt and life after man are both looking incredible. And yeah. I'd say, do you have a favorite shot now that you've edited guilt and it's almost at its kind of screener stage? Do you look back through and you've got like a favorite shot? from the film? Uh, I, you know, for me, I like all when the camera's moving. I don't think I got a particularly kind of favorite shot because, you know, the, you know, the nature of these, the, the films that we've made, we're just moving so quickly. So I kind of have an idea of how I want the shot to go, but usually it's, you know, it's almost like shooting, you know, cinema verite in a, in, in a, you know, like you're making a documentary, you've, you've got all your actors, you know, all kind of lined up and as a DP, you're looking for, you know, trying to create some three dimensionality in your shot with a bit of separation and not having, you know, a large crew or a, a truck with, you know, with any real light control and stuff. So it's really just kind of placing your actors very quickly, looking at, you know, looking at in, through my, through my viewfinder and trying to find the best kind of composition and, you know, how to, how to move and how to move, you know, the lighting that we've got, um, you know, in, into position and, and then snap that shot and then, then moving on to the next. So there was every shot was in a way a little bit challenging because, you know, um, a lot of the locations we, we just walk in and we've got to figure it out on the, on the fly. And, uh, so I think overall I'm, I'm pleased with pretty much all the shots because you know thinking back on how we got them is always kind of a, a pleasure and you know at the time when you're shooting it, you think oh, i hope this works and then you get back in the edit suite and you look at it and think oh, okay that's pretty good <laughs> you know i'm really happy with the result so um but anytime i can get the camera moving especially on the gimbals or you know little cheats or whatever you know like like we did sitting on the back of your truck you know driving at you know 60 kilometers an hour hanging out the window you know and those yeah. shots kind of work they're kind of like wow that's actually yeah that actually is really good, you know. We got away yeah. with something, and you know, a lot of people will never know how it was done and think, well, you must have had a techno crane or some whiz piece of gear, but it was really just, you know, gaffer tape and, and uh, you know, muscle power <laughs> that gets the shot. Yeah. So, exactly. so, yeah, so, so, yeah, no particular shot, but, um, you know, I'm pleased with how all the shots kind of come out. Life After Man, I think probably my favorite shot is the horse shot with the sunset. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know you know, bombing along with a, with a gimbal that's about breaking point, hanging out <laughs> the window <laughs> with the sun dropping and, 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 you know, and, um, and looking at the, looking in the viewfinder, I could barely see, we can hope this, you know, is in frame <laughs> and everything just lined up at the right time. Yeah. And, and it works. Oh, that's good. So, it's an yeah. awesome shot. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so what advice would you give to people who want to shoot their first feature film? I know you said about, starting small with your cameras and working the way up but what about conditions to avoid like what what's the most difficult conditions you'd say to to shoot in and to avoid writing them into your script um probably 
would be like shooting in the rain because rain, you know, has its own kind of problems, not for the fact that, you know, you don't want to get your camera wet, but, you know, you can be shooting in the rain in one, you know, in one direction and you can't even see it because, you know, you have to backlight rain to really see it. And then you turn around to get your other coverage and suddenly it's, you know, bombing down with rain and you can see it. And then so when you go back to the edit suite and you're cutting, it's raining in one shot and not in another, even though it was raining. So um, I think above all, I think the biggest advice for anybody starting out in any in, in making a feature is is control, you know, keeping control, um, having control of your set, you know, especially if you're using outdoor locations um, and making sure you get the, you know, the permissions and all that sort of stuff to shoot because it's nothing worse. And we've experienced it, you know, when you're gorilla ring and stuff that you know someone's going to kick you out and you've you, you've spent half a day getting all these shots and suddenly you can't even finish it the, the work that you set out because you can't get access again and stuff so having control and um knowing that you can you know you can go in and you can block you can you know work with your actors and get the shots and walk away at the end of the day you know so above all is control and, and that control might have to spend money to get that by hiring a location and stuff but um you know and the other things is just preparation you know I, I think the thing with guilt even though we you know we managed to make a make a film we were so time poor and we were always we were always racing and that because we had constraints before going in so we didn't really you know we uh, had a script and uh you know the script could have done with a you know, a few more revisions and stuff because we couldn't get the actors together to give them give them the words and then you want to hear those words by actors and then you can make those little changes. And if you get that script down and then you get on set, everybody knows what they got and you're not sitting there debating, you know, a bunch of dialogue, you know, because all that stuff's been done. And then so you can get on set and everybody's on the same page. But when you're, um, you know, if you're trying to make it up, you're always that's always fraught with danger because then you end up with big continuity problems. Um, so, you know, proper preparation prevents piss poor performance. So we weren't particularly prepared, and we really paid for it at the end. Um, and you know, and that we were as prepared as we could with the time that we were given. Um, but you know, I would have loved a bit more prep. And the thing with guilt is that was only myself and, you know, uh, the main lead, um, Janet, finding locations before we shot. So literally we spent, you know, two weeks finding all the locations for the for the film. And so by the time we even got to the film, we were already knackered just by that sheer workload. So having people that can find your locations and do all that paperwork and get all those permissions. And it was really myself, Janet and, and Lindsay doing uh, a lion's share of the work even before we got to the to the shoot and Lindsay you know she was based in Melbourne so she couldn't help out in that department so she was you know doing as much of the prep work getting on the phone giving us permissions doing all that sort of stuff and then I was doing up here doing all the legwork finding locations um, you know negotiating with people things like that so so by the time you get to that first day of shooting you're completely knackered and you need to be fresh as a daisy because once those cameras roll, it's a, you know, if you're shooting a, a big block, it's, you know, for us, we shot for 15 days pretty much straight. And after 15 days, you are completely flawed. And uh, so, yeah, script, um, get the script right and be properly prepared. You know, cameras are irrelevant at that point. Get a good camera, obviously, to shoot your piece, but that's, you know, you get a good DP, he actually he should come with his camera and, uh, yeah. you know, not worry about all of that, uh, all of that stuff. So, you know, have a, have, you know, look at your script, break it down, work out your scenes, get your actors together, do a script read, then get to set and everybody is on the same page and, um, you know, prepared to work because I think a lot of people in with short films start out on that adventure of making a film and it just gets bogged down in detail. And everybody loses sight of what the end goal is, and everybody loses direction, and it all becomes too hard. And you know, you end up people walk away, and you, and I think a lot of films are never finished.
because it gets it get it does get hard and that can all be eliminated in the beginning if you if you're prepared and for anybody out there who's you know going to be a director or the writer producer director you just got to have tenacity and you got to fight every day to get your to get your um, your script done and stuff but it, you know, at the end of the day it's worth it because you know I forget about all the pain now you know I remember from from your film you know how many days do we spend freezing cold on that farm <laughs> I know. You know, and it's worth it at the end of the day. You know, it's it's, it's like, you know, you look at the you look at the fruits of your labor and you look it up on screen and you forget how you did it. You know, in fact, I think I look at eighty and ninety percent of it. And think oh, I don't remember shooting that stuff. So you know, <laughs> and that's what makes it worthwhile because then you just become an audience member and you can watch it. That's it. Sit back and enjoy the fruits yeah, of your labor. Yeah. That's yeah. it. And knowing that you've done it, it's just a sense of accomplishment because. You know, I think a lot of people want to go make a movie, but a lot of people, you know, don't even try because, you know, one, because a lot of people tell them it's too hard and you'll never succeed. And the other is that, you know, they do try, but they, they don't realize the burden or the amount of work that you're going to have, they're going to have to do. And that puts them off and stuff. But, you know, if you really want to do it, you'll do it and you'll, you'll do anything to do it. And, it, and it, but it is worthwhile at the end of the day, even though you'll probably be poor at the end of it that's it <laughs> you love no money but it's worth it yeah yeah, yeah. No, it's great it's such, such good advice so where do you where do you see now the future of kind of cinema heading like i know we had 3d a couple of years back that seems to have died its death now and yeah. then you've got kind of your 360 and ar now do you think that's gonna take over or do you think the way cinema is is it's here to stay and I think, I, you know, personally, I don't think you can beat the current cinema experience. You know, I think 360 has its place, but I don't think it's a um, an entertainment uh, kind of platform. You know, you know, I had a was involved not so long ago in doing some 360 tests for narrative, and uh, you know, with some with some good friends of mine, I was actually a little bit cranky and stuff because we've been talking about making films for so long and then 360 comes up and it's, oh, we'll do 360. And I'm, I'm like kind of saying, so we just spent five years solving all the other problems. So now we've got all the cameras, we've got all the gear, we've got everything, we should be making a film. And now you want to go solve a whole another set of problems, you know, and, you know, and said, so let someone else figure that out, you know, and I can't, you know, personally don't want to sit in a room with a big headset on to have this, watch this movie you know i think it's i think it'd be great as a as a, an experience you know just to go in especially if it's like a, a good ghost story a short film or whatever but i don't think you know as a filmmaker i want to you know um have people sit in a cinema and then look all around the room you know as a filmmaker yeah. you you want to you know but i've put something over there there's the clue and then you got somebody's looking at the back of the room because oh that looks interesting but i did read some statistics with 360 um and it kind of kind of was like the first and these were videos that were on on um, youtube and you could look at the analytics and this is when we was having these big discussions about doing 360 and it, it kind of transpired that the, it was usually the first 30 seconds people would look around you know and then they would their vision would be usually where we watch movies because the experience was over and stuff yeah. so they started to watch the movie where it's supposed to be so it's like but you went to all this effort um to make this 360 movie but the other issue with 360 movies are where do you put the lights where do you put the crew yeah. everybody has to hide behind trees or duck behind cars and you know it's just like nah nah 3d's again interesting again an experience kind of movie i think it's great for for animation and things like that and i, and I love you know i do like i, I don't Three, three, um, three D movies don't make me sick at all. So I can put the goggles on and watch it, you know, and it doesn't bother yeah. me. So I can enjoy a good three uh, D movie and that. But um, again, for you know, that's for high end productions. You know, you've got to have the the dollars to do it. And most movies now aren't shot in three D. They shoot with just one camera, and they just dimensionalize them after the fact and stuff. So. You know, and I, you know, I have been involved in doing some early 3D kind of testing and things like that. And I've got some very good friends, uh, alpha geeks that worked all that on that stuff. And uh, yeah, but 
again, you know, die to death because I think people just want to go to the movies, you know, yeah. pay that, pay that 10 bucks or 15 bucks, have that popcorn and then just enjoy something and just be transported somewhere else and stuff. So yeah, putting on the headset and, you know, and it kind of isolates you from the person next to you as well. If you're wearing a, a big kind of headset. So yeah, you, anyway. you may as well just sit at, sit at home, sit at home really yeah. and do that. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's, yeah, I think the way we're shooting movies now, you know, you know, even high frame rates. I don't I don't like high frame rates. I think you know, twenty four looks really nice. Um, you know, I don't want to. You know, I mean, there's a big push to have all those TVs. The DPs from Hollywood want all those TVs to come with the default off of that super smooth motion they stick on the on the TVs because it makes your work look like a soap opera. You know, so yeah, so. Anyway, maybe I'm a traditionalist, but uh, yeah, no, no, I'm I, with you on this I one. I like it. Yeah, I like what you're saying. Yeah, look, and also this, from a this... post side of view, you know, I don't want to, yeah. you know, rendering out 24 frames and with a at high res it takes a long time. I don't want to do 48. I know, right? Yeah. Listen, this has been awesome, Carl. Like, I hope this has inspired people to just get out there and make their feature. And you know, you you don't have to have a red, do you, to to shoot a no. movie? It's you no know. Way. No way, you know, you can, there's some amazing, very cheap cameras out there that, you know, just cut your teeth on, on something that's, that's achievable. And eventually, you know, all that stuff will become available as you progress as a filmmaker, people want to work with you and all that high end gear will, will, will naturally kind of come, come with it. But at the end of the day, you know, you can give someone a red camera or an area or, or something like that. And, um, you know, they can still make it look bad. So the camera is just, doesn't doesn't mean a thing. I know it's cliche when you when you own a camera, big camera, saying oh you know, <laughs> you just go use uh, the camera because everybody craving for that for that um, you know new big big toy. But um, yeah, essentially at the end of the day, is most of these you know low end cameras, sub you know five thousand dollar cameras, make amazing images. Like your little black magic pocket cinema camera is just it's, it's amazing camera. <laughs> You know, that's, um, you know, for less than $2,000, you can shoot a feature on that. No problem. Yeah. And, that, and you know, red cameras and Alexas and things, they come with a whole life support team because you've just got to have so much stuff on them. You know, you can, you can make them lightweight, but you know, when, when we're shooting, you saw from, you know, I don't have a big setup, but that was still heavy and that to, to lug that around all day. So yeah. Shoot with what you have. Make good, make good films. That's it. That's the way to do it. So, listen. Where, where can people see more of your work and see your back catalogue of stuff that's that's <laughs> brought you to this point? Um, I don't really have a, a big social media presence, but um, just go to carljenner.net, and that's my DP site. You can see some of the stuff and some of the shorts on there. Um, a lot of my a lot of my stuff, you know, with client it's client work, never really gets ever sees the light of day. But, um, and I'm on, uh, Instagram as, what am I? I'm on Carl Jenner 66. <laughs> Carl, <laughs> Carl Jenner 66. <laughs> so that's how much I use it. Well, there you go. Check all those out and hopefully. I'm getting better. Yeah. You get getting followers. Well, you know, after this, you never know. You might get a couple more followers. We'll see. Might get, might get 10. But, 10 um, more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, no, this has been awesome. Like, I've loved hearing about your story and kind of the process that you go through to shoot. And, like, I'm just blown away with how Life After Man looks. And I think it's probably going to be, like, one of the best-looking zombie movies yeah. of all time. Thanks. Maybe. Yeah, um, and I can't wait to see how, how, how guilt goes and the journey. Yeah. Yeah, like, I've I basically just got the screen already. The film's looking really good. I spent the afternoon painting out logos. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. See the tedious, the tedious work that you end up doing. You know, that's why I always say to people, you know, you always start start out. You start out with like two people, you know, three people with an idea, and then you ramp up to your shooting, and you know, you might have twenty or thirty people, and then eventually one day it's you in a room by yourself. You know, yeah. and uh, you know, just it becomes a labor of love. And I'm a perfectionist and a bit of a you know pixel peeper. So I, you know, I'll go in there and fix stuff that I probably don't even need to fix, but it annoys me. So I, I want to fix it. But um, yeah, so, you know, but the film's looking really, really good. 
and the story wise and everything it all came together and i haven't even done the grade yet or we haven't got a sound mix or anything like that so you know and i'm really really happy and super proud of everybody that worked on it and you know it was a bit of a bit of a journey to, to get there but we got there in the end and you know i think when people see it they'll actually be quite surprised because you know when you're shooting a film it doesn't look like a film you know and i've always said that's one of the reasons i love to operate as a dp because when i look through the lens i actually get to see the movie you know it's extraneous of all the other things that are around you know you don't see any light stands you don't see any other people standing around and that i just look at the lens and look at the actors and once you get a good performance and you know it in, in your in your eye that you can see it happening and you know you've got some good stuff and you just piece together the film in your head and that's the same with guilt and the same with life of man i could see everything as i'm shooting it and stuff so i knew when the edit came together exactly you know how it would look and how it would feel and uh you know and it's once you get into the grade and you start to really craft it and that's you know that's a bit i like as well it's just crafting your movie and uh you know and eventually you can sit back and it looks amazing and sounds amazing and you know it, you know it really really you know you're chuffed to bits that you've actually gone ahead and done it and stuff so but yeah i'm super happy and with your crew you know we i think life after man it felt like a little family you know, when we were tucked away on the farms and all the remote areas and things like that we were, we were filming in and, you know, and uh, we had all those animals and horses and all those yeah. things. And, you know, it really, you really kind of bond. And as, as filmmakers and, you know, I always think in my mind, it's just a bunch of crazy, crazy filmmakers, you know, in the middle of nowhere trying to make this film, you know, and everybody else would be kind of thinking, you, you, you know, we would be laughing at you for doing it, but you know, you, you kind of get a kick out of doing it because it's fun and it's, um, it's fun and it's tough, but it's, it's well worth it. And that sense of com camaraderie and, um, you know, everybody on a, on the same trajectory and it's, it's, you know, inspiring to see. Yeah. I feel like yeah. it's not just the, the movie, it's kind of the journey that you, the people yeah. that you go on the journey with that makes yeah. it, makes the experience kind of what it is. I always find, you know, that first day that everybody meets, you know, no one really knows each other. And, uh, you know, by the end of the journey, you're all like best buddies, uh, you know, people yeah. that, you know, if they'd ring you up and say, Hey, can you come and help me on my thing? And you go, yeah, absolutely. I'll be there in a heartbeat, you know, because, um, they, they, you know, shed blood for you kind of thing. And then, so you're willing to go to bat for them when they need yeah, you. Yeah. And, and at this kind of level, you know, we, you do rely on a lot of favors, um, and people, you know, giving up time and going out of their way and, and stuff. And, that's probably you could use that going back to preparation, you know, for other people's films, just be mindful of people's time and try and schedule around it and stuff, because you, the last thing you want is, you know, to piss, piss your people off and uh, just be, just be mindful of all of that. But um, yeah. And you'll find at the end of that journey, there's some, you'll, you'll end up with some good uh, relationships and then those, those people might get, get a, you know, a really good gig and then bring you along with them and that's how it all works. So, you know, you, you know, you, you never know. So the industry is too small to, to um, you know, to really, you know, kind of piss people off. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But, well, Carl, uh, listen, this has been so good. Like, and I hope everybody's taken a lot of information out of it. And, um, yeah, hopefully you all go on and just have the confidence to shoot your own films. Yeah. So, Carl, thank you very much. No worries. Pleasure. All right. Cheers, mate. All right. See ya action cut and everything in between a comprehensive guide to shooting a feature film all on your own